Um, Rajiv has that rare gift of being able to focus up close on sharp human detail. He uses small strokes deftly to paint a broad picture. He listens more than he talks. Big deal generals and top level sources like his company and speak to him frankly, but so do the grunts and the T-Wallas and so many other minor characters who drive the plot of any major story. This month marks the 10th anniversary of George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq. Nothing written or said better explains the resulting folly than Rajiv's book, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, the Green Zone. Soon we'll be declaring <laughs> victory in leaving Af Afghans to clean up the mess we made there. And <clears throat> yet again, Rajiv gives us a close focus detail and broad stroke reality in a new book, Little America. Right now we face a short term sequester to find $80 billion or so but over the next decade, we've got to scrape up maybe three to five trillion, which is just about <clears throat> what we've managed to squander on an Iraq war that left so many dead and so many more people who hate us. Um, so let's start there. In the frontispiece of <clears throat> to Imperial City, Rajiv quotes T.E. Lawrence, who advised his British superiors in 1917. <clears throat> do not try to do too much with your own hands. Better the Arabs do it tolerably than you do it perfectly. It is their war, and you are there to help them. Actually, under the very odd conditions of Arabia, your practical work will not be as good as perhaps you think it is. And among the flood of encomiums for, a <clears throat> for the book is from the much lamented Molly Ivins, who says, it's like reading a horror novel. You just want to put your face down and moan how could we have let this happen? I mean, how could we have been so stupid? I mean, <clears throat> we had this invasion, and a few of the reporters in the region were drowned out by the Washington juggernaut. Some of us who'd reported from Vietnam recalled how thousand-year-old societies are a little suspicious of saviors with a shopping list. Um, but it happened. So, um, <coughs> so um, what's wrong with us? Good question, Mort. Um, hey, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you all for, for coming out so early on a s Sunday morning. And, and Mort, thank you for, for sitting here with me. Um, you know, we, we're we a great nation. We like to think that we can go out and fix other societies. I think we have a lot to offer, but after spending two plus years observing our nation building efforts in Iraq, um, and now more recently, three years traveling back and forth to Afghanistan to observe what we're doing there. And we're actually spending more money in, in Afghanistan than Iraq. And it, that war has been going on now for more years. It's the longest war our nation has ever been engaged in, longer than even the Revolutionary War. Um, you know, I come away with, with mixed uh, opinions about this. On one hand, you look at both of these wars and say, what are we doing in the business of trying to build, and in some cases rebuild, but in the case of Afghanistan, really literally build from scratch these shattered societies where there's, there's very little human capacity, very little um, uh, uh, infrastructure to speak of, and, and we're, we're sort of building it up from the ground. Um, and, and it really <laughs> makes me wonder, you know, what, what were we thinking? We could, we, we could do this. At the same time, um, you know, I'm not one of these people who's inherently a defeatist, though I've written two very critical books of, of our engagement in these two wars. I like to think in a nation of 300 plus million people, we do possess those who have uh, the relevant and necessary subject matter expertise to provide that sort of um, modest but essential help to, to serve in some ways as modern day Lawrences in these societies. The problem is, is that we, we don't select those people. In the case of the early years of the Iraq War, we chose individuals more for political fidelity than for nation building expertise. In, in Imperial Life, I write about how uh, many of the hires uh, uh, to, or many of the individuals who wanted to go out and work for the Coalition Provisional Authority in 2003 and 2004 were asked by um, officials at the Pentagon questions about things like their views on Roe versus Wade and capital punishment before they were allowed to go out to Baghdad. That got us people like a 24-year-old kid with no background in finance sent out to uh, and given the job to reopen Baghdad's stock exchange. 
or a 21-year-old kid who boasted that his most uh, enjoyable job before going out uh, to Iraq was as an ice cream truck driver. I mean, he was assigned to the team of Americans um, uh, asked to uh, uh, help rehabilitate Iraq's interior ministry. Now, it was different in Afghanistan under the Obama administration. This is where you know, the, the supposed pros were going to be put in charge, and the State Department and USAID and others were, were, were supposed to go and you know, bring in the experts from, uh, from our nation's uh, 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 civil service and our foreign service. The problem was many of our, our best people had already burnt out in Iraq by then, and so they simply kind of put out a, uh, a notice for, for, for jobs to be filled and waited for resumes to come in over the transom. And, um, instead of you know, instead of going out and scouring universities like this, NGOs and nonprofits, uh, the private sector, if I, if I were Obama, what I would have done was have called up the, the, you know, the human resources heads at, at Apple and Microsoft and Google and said, give me one of your people for a year and you know, go out and find people who are willing to live in these austere conditions, find people who are willing, um, who possess some of these, these, these skills. We, we never did that. And so um, I'm not sure that when we look back in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, it really represents the, the best of what our nation can do if we really put our mind to it. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, in fact. I, I don't want to start with inside baseball, but I think it's important that, um, you know, I, I, reporters in situations like this, um, military situations, are no less important than medics. I mean, we've, I mean you know, it's, it's kind of the society's money. It's their blood, um, and, they, we, you know, people really have to know what's going on. So there's a line in... in, in um, Emerald City, there's the wonderful device of kind of dropping real vignettes and italic right through the, through a very interesting narrative. And there's one at the end in the green zone where, right, where you say, um, you know, about an hour, there's, there's a kind of a, a party at the end. And, and um, at the end, a coalition press officer notices two journalists in the crowd and she pulls them aside. And, Who invited you here? She barked. What are you doing here? No press is allowed here. Um, this is a sort of a social occasion at the end. The journalist said they'd been invited by a coalition staffer. The press officer told the journalist to stay put while she consulted with a superior. She returned a few minutes later with a handheld video camera. Kicking them out might cause a scene and would evidently result in a story. The journalist could stay, but they would have to promise on tape that they wouldn't write what they saw. So, quote, we never came to a CPA barbecue, one of them said on camera. These people behind us aren't CPA people drinking beer. We were never here. Uh, another, we will not report the fact that everyone here is celebrating the end of the CPA, the other said. A short while later, Bremer, that's Jerry Bremer, we all remember, and Lieutenant General Sanchez joined the party. Everyone wanted a picture with the two men. Some even asked for an autograph, and then it goes on to the party. But... Um, you know, as one has been spent a bunch of time stay, trying to stay out of pools and embeds and every other damn thing that people have come up with to control reporters, and having covered Vietnam, where you know we could go anywhere we were dumb enough to go, um, how much did we suffer in Iraq and then Afghanistan by not by American reporters and other reporters not really getting a chance to see what was happening? I think it, it, it very much circumscribed our knowledge of what was happening in both of those settings. Um, you know, I, I sort of bucked the, 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 the community of, of fellow journalists by spending as much time as I did in the green zone. Um, now early on, it was probably back April of 2003, so almost 10 years ago, uh, U.S. troops had arrived in Baghdad. It was a, it was a couple of weeks in to the American presence there. Um, there was already some some early, uh, there was looting obviously going on. Uh, the Shiite clergy was rising up in the, in the southern cities of Najaf and Karbala. Um, there were questions about uh, uh, security in, in parts of Baghdad. And uh, American troops were sort of posing the question, when do we get to go home? And I remember being on a, on a scratchy satellite phone call with the then foreign editor of the Washington Post, a very smart man by the name of Phil Bennett, and uh, I was excitedly telling him about all of this. Uh, and he, he listened patiently, and then he, 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 he waited for me to finish, and then he said to me, Rajiv, think back to the best journalism, the best literature to come out of the Vietnam War. It wasn't about Vietnam as much as it was about the Americans who went there to change this country and how they themselves were changed. Focus on the American experience. 
And I thought at this at that point he was just full of it. You know, there was there was you know writing going on. What was I going to worry about that? But 